now see it, person to person, a weekly document for television, as told by the faces and voices of people in the news. And so obviously the higher that a person scores in, say for instance, the Johns Hopkins uh, software means of, of scoring truthfulness, really the more confidence that, that a person can have that that's an accurate. Yes, in other words, when they score an examination as no deception indicated and a probability of deception of less than 1%, that's a tremendously high probability that the person is telling the truth. And uh, is, is that 99 uh, plus score unusual, or is that fairly typical of people who are simply being very truthful? Well, um, <laughs> that's, not, that's not easily answered. It's very complex. It uh, has to do with the comparison questions, has to do with the background. Uh, there's a lot that goes into it, but the breakpoints are the breakpoints. Someone who scores Truthful with a probability of deception of less than 1% is, in fact, deemed to be truthful. And the means by which you examined uh, Eldon Hoke and, and uh, others, obviously, in your office, when you say that Eldon Hoke scored uh, with a possibility of deception of less than 1%, in fact, the Johns Hopkins uh, algorithm doesn't break that down into 99.5%, 99.9%, 99% or less than 1% possibility of, of deception is a, really the highest score that you can get. Yes. So, obviously your professional opinion is that 
in terms of truthfulness on the question of did Courtney Love proposition Eldon Hoke to commit the murder of Kurt Cobain for money, uh, your examination shows that Eldon Hoke could not possibly have scored higher in terms of truthfulness. Eldon Hoke's responses were deemed to be truthful at the highest rating. And so, where are we now, Brad? Well, this would have been the uh, the Cathay de Grand. This is now some kind of uh, um, upside down club. It's called. Over there's the Capitol uh, Records building, and uh, Hollywood Boulevard is right there, and uh, that's Sunset. And this is uh, where you used to be able to come and see Social Distortion play for three dollars, two dollars. Uh, suicidal tendencies played here. The Ramones would play at the Palladium for ten bucks, and the Mentors would play here all the time. And uh, this is where False Alarm hung out. This is where I met um, El Duce, and uh, we'd get drunk here all the time. This building didn't look anything like this. It looked more like Al's bar. It was all dirty. The nice uh, doors weren't here. It was graffiti all along the backside. Um, we would drink in this parking lot. There were punk rock gangs, maybe a hundred people every night, and somehow we were able to get away with it. Every night over there, this wall was covered with graffiti, and we'd all be drinking back here too. And there was a bowling alley that we'd all get drunk up on top of over there. And that was the nightly activity. And uh, that was my childhood. And uh, El Duce was here pretty much every night. And that's how I uh, grew up with El Duce. So tell us how you met El Duce here. Fuck, I can't remember the first time I met him. I just remember that we were drinking and uh, I remember noticing him because he was so funny because he was so drunk all the time. He would always be, uh, you know, making jokes and, uh, you know, everyone hung out with him. And then I saw the mentors play and, uh, uh, you know, we'd just hang out and drink all the time. It was real exciting when you're 15 years old, you know. It's a lot of action. So now, is uh, L.A. Punk what it used to be when uh, no. the Mentors are playing uh, at the uh, club here? No, there's nothing left. You know, they got the Dickies, um, and, uh, you know, there's, uh, there's nothing left. Uh, the Mentors was, uh, you know, that was one of the worst things that we lost from L.A. Punk Rock. There's not, I, you know, what's left, I, I, I don't know. Punk Rock is, uh, you know. Fucked up. Not dead yet. Huh? Not dead yet. Uh, you know, you need something new. You know, rock and roll. You know, you know, there's no need for it. punk rock. You know, rape rock, whatever they call it. It's just all rock and roll. You know, and good creative stuff is you know good. The, the commercial shit they got onto the, the thing. You know, the, the Nirvana was nothing more than. Uh, uh, than like a Ramones music mixed with Black Flag or something. I don't think I don't think I don't know what grunge was. It sounded like punk rock to me. And Courtney Love is like a Sid and Nancy, if you ask me. She's like another uh, Nancy. So I don't you know. And they killed the husband instead of the Sid Vicious killed uh, Nancy. And I guess Courtney killed uh, Kurt. So it's like, but it's ridiculous. Who needs it? So, so many years ago, did you uh, imagine that uh, punk would end this way? Well, you know, you didn't really think about it. I was, I was an alcoholic. I still, you know, I still am, I guess. I don't drink anymore. And I used a lot of drugs, and there was a lot of excitement. I was a criminal. Um, and, uh, you know, I still try and uh, work on things. I try and, uh, what few people left, I'm, I was trying to... Uh, get, you know, like El Duce, and interview them for books. I've uh, got Keith from uh, uh, Black Flag and Circle Jerks. I got uh, TSOL. I got uh, El Duce. That's how I stumbled upon all this shit. And, um, you know, I Jeff Dahl and uh, 
doing Stan from the Dickies next week, an interview with him. I've been putting that off for a month. And uh, my own band, False Alarm. And, uh, you know, I'm, you know, there's things like that to do now, write books about it. And uh, I'm trying to put out some cool CDs. But, you know, um, what can you do? Who, who really has the energy to keep punk rock going? Who, who cares? You know? So, Brent, if, if punk didn't die, it at least died down here in L.A. Things have died down quite a bit, right? Yeah, there's no, there's no scene whatsoever. You know, the Green Day and the Offspring. I, I can't approve of that uh, music. You know, the Mentors, I think, you know, that was comedy, you know. But that's the way it always is. You know, you got people like Lenny Bruce who never get appreciated, you know. You got, uh, you know... Bands like the Dickies, you know, I think they should be. They're a great band. They deserve much more. Um, well, let me ask you, Brent, if uh, if people are saying punk is dead, which is uh, something that uh, people will say, I mean, did it just die or did somebody kill it? Um, well, Daryl uh, Gates was trying to stop punk rock. He was trying to... Uh, uh, make a rule against uh, dancing and he tried to stop this club here uh, saying that the slam dancing no dance permit and then the police were against us but on the other hand you know we had a hundred the hoodlums in this parking lot and then nothing would happen and we would riot and we'd run down the street breaking car windows every other week <laughs> and we were allowed to get away with it I don't think Kiki now it's a nice little uh, shopping center with it subway station, you know, so who knows if uh, it, what happened. But now, you know. so Brent, back in the day, the good old days, for those who are unfortunate enough to uh, have never attended a, a Mentors concert, what what was a Mentors concert at the Café de Grande like? Oh, you know, it's hilarious, you know, when you're 15 and you see El Duce, you know, who was about 10 years older than me, maybe 12 or 13 years older than me. You see him uh, running around, the pants are falling down, he's grabbing at girls, attacking girls, uh, you know, pulling his pants down, trying to get a blowjob on stage. You know, these are your, uh, you know, your adolescents, and, and you're amazed. It's hilarious. Your mother didn't allow you to see this kind of stuff, and you've seen it for the first time, and they told that it's not appropriate, but at the same time, you're drunk, and it's making you laugh hysterical, and uh, it's, it was great entertainment, and not... It wasn't the common entertainment. Most people didn't get to see it. The, the kids are going, uh, you know, packing the Civic Center to see Green Day are not seeing this kind of entertainment. No, uh, or Nirvana. I think Kurt Cobain hit his head on the speaker or something. Uh, but that's not, you know, that's not the real thing. That's a, that's a good imitation. He did. A, Kurt Cobain did a good imitation. The corporate uh, rock sucks or whatever you know that's great but um courtney love is uh now she's a uh, uh princess and uh, i don't know i don't know what to, to tell you what else would you like to know did, did you ever see the uh, courtney love band playing back in the hole yeah my friend Eric gorman has a bunch of videos he would videotape every he died he got killed he um had a bunch of videos of el duce too and he has a bunch of videos of uh, Hole. Uh, you know, they were just another horrible uh, band. Started, in the, I don't know when they started. So, when so Brent, you, you compared uh, your friend El Duce to Lenny Bruce. And uh, people are going to wonder what that's all about. What, what are the similarities between the two performers? Well, I think that, uh, you know, they're both hilarious. And... Uh, and they both had a, uh, what you might call a dirty, filthy act in some ways, um, or people would say that. Um, but I thought both acts were amusing. Uh, they both start off in uh, burlesque kind of clubs, or part of their career was spent uh, in the. I know El Duce worked at the Ivar, and I think he worked at Jumbo's with Courtney Love when she was a stripper, I think. Um, and I think that's part of the way they met. Other than that, I know that. Uh, Sicky wife Peter from the Mentors dated uh, uh, Carolyn Rue, who was, I guess, one of the girls in the hole back in the days. And I guess back then, before uh, Hole had not made it at that time, you know, they were just a garage band playing in like a Dallas bar or something. Um, and uh, 
the mentors, you know, they would headline big clubs, you know. So I guess they were, you know, I guess that was the big time for Paul to hang out with El Duce. So El Duce was a star when Courtney Love was just kind of some stripper chick, basically. Um, you could say that. Um, uh, you know, I mean, star compared to who, I mean, you know. Um, he wasn't a huge star. He was a well-known uh, uh, icon, you know, of, uh, of uh, punk rock in L.A. And he could pack a house. Hulk couldn't, I don't think they could pack the coconut teaser. I mean, they'd do a lot better opening for the mentors than playing their own show, that's for sure. So now, what's that connection again between a member of Hole and a member of the Mentors? It's my understanding that would, uh, Sicky Wife Beater, who plays with the Mentors, uh, dated Carolyn Rue, who played with Hole, who I think she's died or something, I don't know, someone killed her, she owed it, I don't know. And was your understanding from speaking to El Duce, you know, during the last year of his life that, uh, that he knew Courtney Love well from from those days in the 80s. Yeah, because she was very, you know, familiar with him because he was a famous, you know, guy from the punk scene and she was trying to um, you know, get involved in that. She wanted to be a famous punk rock uh, musician. That was her goal and El Duce was already where she was trying to get. So sure, she remembered him and knew him and he paid attention to her because he would notice any uh, girl who would chase after him or whatever. So when people are saying, well, El Duce was this, you know, minor character in L.A. punk and Courtney Love was just some hanger-on chick, th there's no direct connection just to talk about them in general terms, but in your conversations with El Duce, he made it clear that they did know each other fairly well back in the 80s. Yes, he made it clear. And so they had, uh, they had uh, one member of the mentors was basically dating one member of Hole, and this caused them to cross paths, interact socially, whatever you'd want to talk. He used the word relations a lot when I was talking to him. So what, what did he mean, relations? I don't know. But uh, did he, now when she approached him at the rock shop, was it like, Hey, El Duce, you remember me? And, and of course, he did remember her immediately from their knowing each other many years before? Yes. I don't know how many years it had been, or months since they had seen each other, or years, or what, but uh, um, she pulled up in a limo and, uh, you know, confronted him and told him the story that she's having trouble with her husband. And uh, that's when the story went out that uh, El Duce says that she offered uh, 50000 to uh, whack Kurt Cobain. And you know for a fact, based on what El Duce told you during the last months of his life, that they did know each other fairly well back in the 80s, so it wasn't surprising that when she was a big star she would still be interested in speaking to him for some reason. I mean, anyone would be interested in speaking to El Duce because he's a h hilarious, you know? You become a big star, it doesn't make him any more hilarious, you know? In 1994, I mean, uh, wasn't she, I don't know if she's still on drugs or what, but um, she would have been on drugs, I would think, in that period, and uh, anyone on drugs would find El Duce extremely amusing. He was hilarious. He was like an acid trip, man, you know? And, uh... What did uh, Dooch say about seeing her on that occasion? I mean, did he... He said he thought she was crazy. He said, uh, uh, out of her mind. Uh, I don't recall everything he said. He said a lot of bad things about her. I, you know, I don't know. He said bad things about her. Yeah, he thinks that, you know, she, you know, he didn't like her behavior and I, you know. Well, you know how these things go. You, you, in a music scene or anything else, there are some people who like each other and some people who just don't like each other at all. What was L.D. Chase's opinion of Courtney Love? 
Um, I, you know, nothing special. Yeah, he, he, you know, he, uh, he thought she was crazy for that, you know, what she'd offer and all that, that you know, and, uh, if you ask me a specific question on that, you know, Okay. Uh, he didn't like give, get into his opinion on philosophy of Courtney Love, you know. Right, but now it, it's established essentially as a matter of fact, because of course El Duce passed the lie detector test, that Courtney Love offered El Duce fifty thousand dollars to murder Kurt Cobain uh, about three months before his death. That's what El Duce stated to me as well. Yeah, and. What did he think of that? Did did he think she was kidding? Did he think she he was said insane? That he thought she was out of her mind, and uh, you know he had different mixed feelings about it. But he told her, he she says, she, how, how did she get in touch with him? So he said, uh, call Sep at the Sep at her, I can't pronounce his name, Sep. Call him at the rock shop, and that he would get in touch. Then he said he. Uh, left town to go on tour with the mentors and he said that he passed the information on to some other people and uh, I guess he exchanged numbers with her contact information I don't know what exactly transpired and uh, he said that uh, you know what did he say? A lot, you know, I'm getting sleepy here. Cars driving by. You know what I was just about to say that is So Brent, uh, here we are at the uh, site of Al's Bar in downtown LA, and uh, this is the uh, very site where uh, you last saw El Duce uh, in 1997. Right. Um, yeah. This is the back room. Well, for some reason, the bar is closed tonight. It's um, one o'clock. It shoots up until two or three in the morning before they unload everyone. This is where I last saw El Duce behind this door. 
where they bring the, uh, if we can get in here somehow. This is where they bring the equipment in and out. Yeah, this is like a backstage. Yeah, this is where I talked to Aduce, where he told me he was afraid for his life. Over here is uh, This is the entrance, so you can get in there, but it's closed. We'll come back tomorrow night. But this is uh, downtown LA, and uh, this is a long-standing uh, site for some pretty good musical acts. Oh. And uh, in yeah. fact, it is the site of the last performance of the legendary Mentors. With El Duce, yeah. The corner store right here, this is the American Hotel. This is a real scummy part of town. But it's artistic too, there's a lot of uh, artistic stuff. For some reason everything is closed. You can usually buy cigarettes right here and stuff like that. That's downtown LA, the shitty part. Now, should we get the fuck out of here? Everything's dead here tonight. We can come back. I can show you inside. Come but on. Brent, what uh, what was El Duce afraid of? Well, the last night he was afraid for his life. He was completely freaked out, as I've said before. Now, most people would say that Al Duce gave off a pretty intimidating presence, at least uh, as a stage performer. Uh, he, he did sort of stride through uh, life rather confidently, didn't he? What do you mean confidently? Well, he went all around the country uh, conducting himself in a rather outrageous way uh, with his act, and uh, he, he seemed to be relatively fearless, as, uh, as, most, people, uh, as most people would go. Uh, he was drunk quite often. Um, yeah, but we can put in the form of a question there. Well, what you're saying is that the normally uh, either uh, happily uh, on this night, you mean this particular night? Right. The last conversation I had with him was in here. I was telling him to kick it with me, come back to Hollywood. He was all freaked out. He wanted to go back to Riverside in the end and work things out. He said he was afraid of uh, Alan Wrench. And did he say that he wanted to uh, work things out with Alan Wrench? He said he wanted to work things out with Alan Wrench. So what what he was concerned about was uh, a statement that he made to uh, that filmmaker uh, from England about uh, who killed Kurt Cobain. He was concerned before that. He did, told me on a tape uh, about a week earlier or so. Uh, he gave me, he named Alan Wrench and he told me some other things which I'm not going to talk about. He told me a bunch of stuff that he was concerned about, that he talked too much. By the time that filmmaker uh, from England, whatever his name was, got to him, he was already talking about getting the FBI involved to get him after Alan because he was scared. Uh, in here, he was all freaked out, asking me to get him a fake ID at Alice Bar back in that room. Um, I told him that, uh, you know, I would do anything to help him. I called a few people to see, you know, if I, I was kind of drunk myself that night. But, um, in the end, it ended up that he uh, said he wanted to go back to Riverside, work things out. He said he had to work things out, that Wrench was pissed off, and he had to work things out with people, that's what he said. So basically what was going on, uh, as, as I understand the story, is that El Duce seemed to have Can you get the camera reason. a little bit back from me? It's too close to my eyes with that fucking right. light. Yeah. El Duce seemed to have substantial reason to believe that Alan Wrench was directly involved in the murder of Kurt Cobain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's what he was afraid of, is that Wrench was concerned that he was going to be named. He already named him to me on, the, on the, my interview tape. El Duce had named him a week or so prior to me. I'd been doing a book on punk rock. I'd been interviewing everyone. I'd been playing in punk rock bands since I was a kid. False Alarm, my band, and uh, I interviewed Black Flag, I interviewed TSOL, I interviewed uh, Adolescents, and I called up El Duce, because I've known El Duce since 1982 from the uh, Cathay de Grand. We would hang out, I'll take you there next if you like. It's fuck some kind of, I don't know what the hell kind of club it is now, but it used to be a club like this, all dirty. Uh, this club's been here for 30 years or something, but the Cathays was in 81 through 83 or 4. And, um, what was the point? And then in, in that phone conversation, when you say that 
that he named Alan Wrench. What, what do you mean he named him? He told me that Courtney Love had offered him the well-known story of Courtney Love offering the $50,000 to kill Kurt Cobain. He told me that he passed this information on to Alan Wrench and some other individuals. And uh, he told me that he had reason to believe and evidence that Alan Wrench was the one who went ahead and uh, whacked Cobain. Now whether or not Wrench whacked Cobain or not, I have no proof, it's hearsay. But what I do have is the fact that he was freaked out, that Wrench was pissed off, and he told me here that night. The next day, after he le left here, after I told him, you know, come with me if you had a problem, the next day he went back, I talked to heathen scum from the mentors, and uh, he um, said that uh, the next day he wanted to try more things out with Wrench, he ended up at the train tracks dead. The next day. And as I understand the story from Mr. Wrench himself, Alan Wrench was the person who was in El Duce's presence minutes before, within five minutes of Duce's death. Yeah. Do, do you think that Alan Wrench killed El Duce? Yeah. You think that he murdered him? Yeah, I think that for sure. And you think that uh, Alan Wrench murdered El Duce, Eldon Hoke, because Eldon Hoke was talking about the possibility that Alan Wrench was the hitman on the Kurt Cobain murder. Yeah. And now, did he use that word with you, hitman? Yeah. He used that word, hitman, in a phone conversation with you. Yeah. In other words, El Duce said, Alan Wrench. He's both the names. hitman. Both names. Alan Wrench, he's the hitman. Alan Wrench, he's the hitman on Kurt Cobain. Yeah. Alan Wrench murdered Kurt Cobain. That's what El Duce told me uh, a week or so before the night here at Alice Bar. When, I, when he called me, he was freaked out. He had done that BBC thing where he had said, Alan, they not going to get the FBI after this guy, Alan, or something. And he was already freaked out. This night, he was really freaked out. And in the end, after I told, tried to tell him, you know, you know, let's go back to Hollywood and deal with it, you know, and I'll take you to a friend's house. He thought the best thing was to go to Riverside to try and work things out with people, he said. So he thought he could have some people talk to Wrench or something. I don't know. And then when I heard it the next day, Wrench took him to get beer or something. And from what he then told me, they were arguing in the back. He then scum told me he couldn't overhear what the argument was about necessarily. But they were arguing or something. And uh, they took off to go get the beer. And El Duce never came back and he got hit by a train. So in other words, Alan Wrench, in the midst of this argument, drove off with El Duce. Yeah, he was highly intoxicated, took him to the train tracks. And El Duce was dead moments later. Yes. I mean, I wasn't there, but that's what happened. Everyone knows it. That's what happened. And so you believe that Alan Wrench murdered your friend El Duce? Yeah. Yeah. And do you think that... Uh, now, El Duce was a very sizable person physically and probably was capable of defending himself. Do you, do you have reason to believe that Alan Wrench was even more physically dangerous? Well, Alan Wrench, he's a judo expert. He's a gun hobbyist, or whatever you call it. Uh, yeah, he's a, he, you know, he's, and, and El Duce was extremely intoxicated. So you think that he used his martial arts skill to somehow Subdue or you know, I don't that's yeah. all theory. That's speculation. I don't know if he got him drunk and then put him on the train tracks I don't know exactly what kind of manipulation he used I just know that from what I understanding El Duce was already very intoxicated Alan took him to get more beer at the train tracks and then Alan's made statements like uh, Like if El Duce is talking too much and drinking too much. It's not my fault if he gets hit by a train And if I take him to the train tracks, that's not my fault He's talking and drinking too much. That's what happens. And these are conversations that you had with the the apparent hitman, the possible hitman, Alan Wrench, in, yeah, in the subsequent him. years. Yeah, I interviewed him too afterwards, yeah. Yeah. And so you've discussed this in depth with, with him, and overall your impression is that you believe that he's guilty of the murder of El Duce. Yeah, I mean, I don't know 
exactly what happened. I know that he took him to the train tracks. I know he was pissed off at him. And in the statements he made to me, if he's talking too much and drinking too much and I take him to the train tracks and he gets killed, it's not my fault. Whether or not he pushed him in front of the train or not, he took him there with that intention. I don't know exactly what happened. I wasn't there. All I know is that she was terrified here the night at Al's bar. I wanted to work things out with people. He said Wrench was pissed off and he wanted to go back to Riverside and work things out. He thought he still had a chance to work things out. Are, are you afraid of Alan Wrench? No. And why are you not afraid of Alan Wrench? I'm just not afraid of Alan Wrench. I don't want to talk about the reason why. But you do feel that obviously he is dangerous. Sure. What are you doing with the camera like that? What is this? Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> so, Brent, uh, we're here outside of Al's bar, and uh, well, why don't you tell us uh, what uh, what was El DJ all about as a performer? What uh, what would one see if one attended a, a mentor's performance at Al's Bar? You see a comedian, a, a drunken comedian, uh, 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 with a great music, a great uh, music. Uh, you know, I put him up there, he's like a Lenny Bruce. The guy was hilarious. He was as quick as Lenny Bruce. I mean, that's pushing it, but he was quick. And uh, known for his outrageous humor, uh, and uh, raucous behavior, and yet, uh, as much as El Duce enjoyed his life and career as a performer, mm -hmm. in the last night of his life, here at Al's Bar, you knew that there was something wrong. Yeah, yeah. I had interviewed him uh, prior in the month of April, uh, about seven, ten days before the show, uh, he had called me, told me to come down here, he wanted to talk to me, and I usually attend mentor shows at Al's Bar. I like to, one of my favorite places to see the mentors, and uh, I've been hanging out with El Duce since uh, I was a kid, from the Cathay de Grand, from 82, and uh, that night I came down, and he only did half his show that night. He left the stage, he went right here, if you turn the camera over here, to the back room, which is closed right now. And that's where we had our conversation, right there. In the doorway. In back, behind the doorway. Yeah. Now, uh, you obviously had a, a pretty meaningful conversation on the subject of him feeling fear about the Allen Wrench situation. Yeah. Yeah, he was freaked out. He had uh, told me... I, I'm doing a series of interviews, like I've gone over here. Uh, I've been writing a book, and I've been doing a series of interviews on the punk rock scene. I did Keith, you know, from Black Flag, Circle Jerks, I did TSOL, I did uh, Jeff Dahl, Samoans, uh, done, you know, all kinds of interviews, and I called El Duce, because I've known him for years. So I called up El Duce, and I did a series of interviews with him, and on the last interview, you know, he had discussed the Courtney Love thing, you know, on the last interview, which was about 10 or so days, I would say, before this show, he told me uh, Alan Wrench was the name of the guy. He told me he didn't do the job with the, the, the Courtney Love had offered him the 50000 but he didn't do it. He t passed it on to a guy named Alan Wrench. He had told me some other stuff, too. He mentioned the you know, I don't want to get all into it, but the murder junkies and all that. He had mentioned other stuff as well. But he told me that Alan Wrench was the hitman. That was his words. Now, a Alan Wrench was the hitman. Let me think for a second. Alan Wrench, he's the hitman. Alan Wrench, he's the hitman. Yeah. In other words, Courtney Love propositioned El Duce to kill Kurt Cobain for $50,000. El Duce said no. No, he didn't say no, according to El Duce. Now, this is El Duce's testimony to me. He said uh, for her to call him. In other words... But he had to leave town. And he referred Alan Wrench and some other people. And out of those people who were involved, 
either wrench contracted it or did it himself is what El Duce led me to believe. You mean that, that he never really said no to Courtney Love in terms of taking the contract to kill Kurt Cobain. He made a reference. He referred Courtney Love to this Alan Wrench character. I don't know if he did it intentionally. Because th he told me he didn't know if she was serious, if she was joking. I don't think that he did that intentionally. But his impression was that somehow he had... He had made the information of what she had said to him, what he says that she had said to him, to, uh, to other people, to Wrench and other people, and, and it must be that someone had got in touch with her, or she got in touch with someone else. He said he passed it down the passed it over to somebody else, is what he said. I don't know if he meant for this to happen, or meant for anything to happen. And so you were having a... a I don't know what happened. An in-depth conversation with El Duce about a week before he died, and he told you, Alan Wrench, he's the hitman. He murdered Kurt Cobain is, is what that means, right? Yeah. So El Duce, who passed the lie detector test, Mm -hmm. uh, with Dr. Gelb, as you know, ha had a, a lot of standing in this case. That is, he was a very credible witness because he had passed that lie detector test that established, apparently, that Courtney Love really propositioned him to murder Kurt Cobain for $50,000. Right, well, you know, uh, th talk to the lie detector guy. That's what El Duce told me. He's never lied to me before. I have no reason to doubt it. You know, and so you were I, I'm not a witness to any of that. I'm a witness to El Duce freaking out here at Al's bar, scared of Alan Wrench for naming him as the killer. And I'm also aware that the next day El Duce ended up dead in the presence of Alan Wrench. And do you really feel that, uh, based on all of your research, your conversations, your interviews with? El Duce, and then obviously after his death, your conversations with Mr. Richard Allen Wrench. Viewing the totality of all of the information you have over the last three years, are, are you saying that you believe that on April 19th, 1997, that Richard Allen Wrench murdered your friend El Duce? Uh, you know, I was not there, and I don't know what the charge would be, you know? I know that he drove him to the train tracks. I know he's drunk. And I know when I interviewed Wrench, he told me if El Duce is drinking too much and talking too much, and I take him to the uh, train tracks and, and he gets hit by a train, is that my fault? Uh, you know? Yeah, I believe he brought him to the tracks with, you know, bad intentions. You know? So, regardless of what you could possibly prove, what you believe is that Alan Wrench murdered your friend El Duce. Yeah, I think El Duce had told me he had other evidence. And I believe that El Duce had more evidence. And, he, and I believe there was other people involved who could testify that he didn't want to, uh, to get out. Including possibly the murder junkies, this one person he said. Which is a band from New York City. Those are people that uh, El Duce mentioned as possibly involved in this conspiracy. Yes, and I think Alan Wrench knows them too. And Alan Wrench, do you think that uh, physically uh, he is a person who would be capable of subduing or in some other way killing a substantial large man like El Duce? Yeah. So he's a, he's a judo expert as I understand it. That's what I've been told, yeah. Yeah, and a sort of a professional wrestler. Street fighter kind of guy, judo wrestler, or whatever. I don't know what the fuck you call it. Karate, jiu-jitsu. I don't know what the fuck you call it. Now, uh, everybody knows that uh, El Duce was famous for his uh, sense of humor, mm -hmm. and uh, everyone says that his uh, stage act was very, very funny. It was hilarious. Yeah. But... Uh, Everyone is going to want me to ask this question. R regardless of all of the information you have, could you, could you just answer this question? Mm -hmm. Is there any chance that him being freaked out, as you say, that this was all some sort of a gag or a put on by El Duce? No. No, I don't the guy. Why would you do a personal gag like that for me? 
I'm talking to him in the back room. It's it's me, you know, and him and a couple of people walking around. And why would he do that, you know? And it wasn't even funny. It was pathetic. He was freaked out. And he kept on drinking and he was smoking a joint. And he was freaked out, asking where to get a fake ID. Talking. He said, you know, it's three years ago. I think he said somebody had a brother or something, or someone who was like a brother to him in another state where he could go stay for a while. He was talking about leaving the state. Yeah, he was talking about fake ID. He was talking about leaving the state, and you know, swamps and trains. And people were like, uh, not trains. What was it? Uh, he was talking about like, uh, what was the thing? Uh, Cornfields. You mean people ending up dead? Yeah. Yeah. So in the last night of his life, El Duce was talking about the possibility of ending up a dead guy in a swamp. Yeah. And he was seriously talking about moving out of state and staying somewhere else for some period of time. But then he decided not to do that. What what did he decide? He got real fucked up and he said he was going to go back and work it out. He said Alan Wrench was pissed off and he had to go back to Riverside and talk to people. And he's going to work it out. But it was all fucked up. If he was thinking straight, he would have come back with me. But that, those were his exact words. He was going to work it out with Alan Wrench, basically. I believe he said, I'm going to, you know, you're know, going back three years here, but what did he say? He said, I'm going to work it out with some... He said, Alan Wrench is pissed off, and people were pissed off, and he kept on mentioning Wrench's name. And then he said, i, I got to go back to Riverside and work it out with some people back there. They'll work it out for me. Well, Brent, based on the totality of your research and having uh, been a close friend of uh, Is it El necessary Duche? to come this close with the light in my, right. in my fucking eyes? Like this. Right. Brent, based on, on the totality of your research, your friendship of many years with El Duce, mm -hmm. your conversations about the Cobain murder mm -hmm. with El Duce just before his death, your experience in seeing him the last night of his life here at Al's Bar, do you really believe that Richard Allen Wrench murdered Kurt Cobain? Yeah. You believe that... Oh, Elvin wait a minute. You're saying El Duce or Cobain? Well, take your pick. Uh, I believe that Allen Wrench was involved with the Cobain thing. I don't know. I can't... I can't that's speculation. I, yeah, I believe that El, uh, that El Duce told him about the job. That, that supposedly Courtney had offered him, and I believe that Wrench was involved. Whether or not he pulled the trigger, El Duce said, yeah, he did. El Duce told me he's the hitman. I don't, I can't prove one way or the other that Wrench is the hitman. I, I think definitely he was involved in some way, and probably did do it. I think that the, the road ends with Alan Wrench, unless there can be some new witnesses involving testimony on Alan Wrench. So in other words, you can't prove anything in terms of Alan Wrench killing Kurt Cobain, but you can prove that El Duce named him as the hitman. I mean, it adds up. If you look at the facts, look at the simple facts, man. El Duce tells me Alan Wrench ten days or so before this night at the Owl's Bar. Then three days before he's dead, or four days, whatever it was, He's on that BBC thing and he says Alan and the FBI is going to come after him and take care of him because he's already freaked out because Alan or whatever found out that he told me the name. Because when he told me the name, there was somebody else in the room. Because he came back and he said, hold on a second, don't say that I said Alan's name. Blah, blah, blah. And uh, so by the time a few more days go by and he does that BBC thing, he's talking about he wants to get the FBI after Alan Wrench, get rid of him. He's freaked out. The night he comes here, two or three more days later at the last mentor show, he's completely freaked out talking about cornfields and all that and trying to get a fake ID. He finally, you know, and as we've gone over this enough times here, he goes back to Riverside to try and work things out. In the end, that's his final decision. He says Wrench is pissed off and he has to go talk to people in Riverside to work it out. The next day, he's with Wrench. Wrench takes him to the train tracks. He gets hit by a fucking train. He's dead. Yeah, that tells me that, you know, Wrench wouldn't have done that for no reason. You're saying that Alan Wrench murdered El Duce? Yeah. You, you feel certain of that? It's my opinion. And likewise, what is your opinion on Alan Wrench being involved in the murder of Kurt Cobain? I can't see another motive why he would have had to take care of El Duce if he didn't have something to cover up. Now, what exactly his role was in 
the murderer, El Duche, told me he was the hitman. He also told me other stuff, but I'm not going to go into because I'm not going to start incriminating a bunch of other people who I don't, you know, who, but, did, but who didn't Brent, take him to the train tracks. What you just said is that El Duche said he's the hitman, Alan Wrench, meaning Alan Wrench was the hitman for Kurt Cobain. Yeah. And I think that either Wrench did it or had some involvement in doing it. I think that Wrench is where the investigation ends. If it, you know, if, if either it ends at Wrench or it ends at Wrench talking and saying what happened. I think Wrench knows what happened. Either Wrench pulled the trigger or knows directly who did it. Alan Wrench either murdered Kurt Cobain or Alan Wrench knows who murdered Kurt Cobain. Yeah, he, either that or he got someone to do it. You want me to keep his name out of it? 